Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 19 of the Good People, Bad Intentions podcast. And today is my guest. I have Brad Sullivan. Brad is an entrepreneur as well as a motivational speaker. If you see him on Instagram or on TikTok at the real Brad Sullivan, uh, he posts a lot of insightful videos about um, everything from success, you know, to to finding motivation, to business, to waking up early, and getting your your day started. And he, of course, is also a uh, professional mixed martial arts fighter um, so the way that I found out about Brad was actually from a former guest and friend uh, Andrew Thomas he talked about uh, Brad being a really good candidate to be a guest and Brad has actually been um, hosting the Fight League Atlantic podcast again one of the podcasts that inspired this podcast uh, and he also has some uh, ambitions to start his own podcast. So I'm really looking forward to having this conversation and kind of extracting, you know, his own life experience and uh, his fight and how he got into fighting. But then also trying to look at the entrepreneurial aspects, the motivational aspects and other things. So that way, you know, everybody that's listening will be able to get something from it. So without further ado, here's Brad. Hello, Brad. How, how's it going? What's up, my brother? What are you saying? It's going very well. A little bit under the weather this morning, but, uh, you know, no excuse to, to put things off or cancel anything because eh, you only got so much fucking time anyways, right? So you got to keep on rolling no matter what. True. And you're, you're a huge proprietor of the early morning, you know, starting your day right, you know, doing those those tasks that you, you know, put off a lot of people don't even accomplish in their day doing those early on. Can you just talk a little bit about your journey getting to, to where you are now, where you're waking up early, you're getting stuff okay. done, you're reading. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that journey has definitely been a long one and it's been up and it's been down like anything else, man, you start off and you're like, wow, actually, I should, shouldn't say a generality like you start off like everybody does. I start off. I'm like, okay, I read this. I'm going full fucking tilt. This is it. Right? So, um, you know, I, I struggled with anxiety. I struggled with sleeping. And that's kind of where it all started off with. And a lot of it had to do with um, when I was fighting as well. Right? So I was trying to optimize my body and just make everything the best that it could be and along the way of doing that stuff along with um, getting some recommendations from a sports doctor that I was using there uh, sports doctor coach she's you know she's awesome all over I always fucking say she's the best to anybody who will even listen right but <clears throat> along with a lot of the recommendations that I was getting to help me sleep was starting off in the morning so you know, everything just kind of goes part and parcel. It starts spiraling in and, and working in together. It's really cohesive. What you do in the morning is really going to dictate how you sleep at night. But then once I started getting into all this and realizing that, well, there's a lot more to it. There's, you know, there's so many, you know, we want to get into all the stats and bullshit, but, you know, but there's so much to if somebody gets up and just starts going at it in, in the morning. You have so much more time for productivity, and there's just all kinds of links to, to being more successful throughout your day, right? You really, it just, it compounds as it goes, right? Sorry, my throat's a little bit messed up there today. Like I said, I'm a little under the weather. No <laughs> but like I said, if you're, you know, for me, I get up at 4, 4.30-ish, and it's not because I want to every day. Don't don't ever think that, right? <laughs> because I'm just like everybody else, man. I I just push that button and be like, I can pass back. Oh, I really could. But I know that if I wake up at say even five thirty, well that that throws everything off because then my daughter. My beautiful little baby, 
you know, she's going to walk out of her room at six o'clock because she's also a morning person, right? So she walks out of her room. So at that point, I haven't gone to the gym. I haven't already, you know, read a couple pages on a book. I, I don't need to read, I don't need to read 30, 40 pages on a book, but, you know, just something to get the, get the brain flowing, get things going. I, you know, do some breath work or do some meditation or something of that nature. Right. I try not to do everything all at once, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. you know, when I go to the gym, I'm not at the gym for an hour and a half. You know, I'm from the time I'm leaving my house, it takes me probably five minutes to get to the gym. I would say there and back, I want to be, you know, 45 minutes to an hour tops. Mm -hmm. Right. So. And, you know, doing my, whether I'm reading a book or if I'm doing some breath work or, you know, whatever the case may be, even if I come back and I am a little late and she's already out, we'll do some yoga together. You know, she's always at me. Let's do some yoga, right? So, um, but my point is like getting up at that, that four, four thirty mark, it gives me that time to do the stuff that I need before everything goes crazy, right? Because that's kind of where it's at. But along the way of doing this, so <clears throat> I figured out that everything else in my day just compounds off of this. And what I mean when I say that is it's either going to compound in a good way or it's going to compound in a very bad way. Um, and the very good way, in, in the perfect world, I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I have my gym for 45 minutes to an hour. Obviously, it takes me about 15 minutes to get out the door. You know, you get up, and you're like, where am I, right? Trying to figure out if you're still at the bar or not, right? So I get up, get out <laughs> the door, and, and, and get, get back, do, read, you know, for 30 minutes, breath work for 30 minutes while I'm trying to sip on something like that. You know, I try not to drink coffee too early mm -hmm. because by the time – normal folks start waking up around six thirty, seven o'clock, I'll be too coffee deep. I'm just like, <laughs> look like Kramer off Seinfeld ready just to bust in the door at work, right? But if I can do all of these really good habits in the morning, then I am completely set up for my day. I have my anxiety levels are way down. So then I just walk into the office i walk into whatever setting it is like from today i work at home every wednesday right that's just something that i've worked out you know uh, at my work there being a general manager it's just one of the perks of the position that i have right um so i walk into whatever situation it is full confidence i already know that i'm just i'm good i'm ready to go you know Leaders are readers, and I thought that was the stupidest saying when I was when I was young. But if you're not reading, you're not growing. And the the fact is that I'm reading every single morning, so I have something that's super beneficial. I have stuff that I can add that's going to give value to people, whether it's on social media, whether it's on my um, whether it's my team because I lead a team meeting meeting every single morning. So when I walk into there, my anxiety levels are just nice and nice and low, you know, they're in the green, so to speak. And I've already done all these fantastic habits. Well, when everything starts coming at me, because it does, hey, and it's just, this is what it is. It's X, whoever X is, with a problem. So if I'm not the best version of myself, and I can't give back, and I can't be the problem solver that I need to be for the company and for each individual personally, right? Um, but the opposite of that, even if I wake up at five thirty, <clears throat> and then I, I don't get down to do my workout, I don't get to do my breath work, and then the kids wake up, and then listen, I don't know if you have, do you have kids? No, not yet. Listen, anybody that says their kid is a ray of sunshine all the time, and they don't, they're, you know, oh, they can do no wrong. <laughs> they're a fucking liar. All right. <laughs> Respectively speaking, they're a fucking liar. No, <laughs> no it's um, you know they're 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 amazing, but they like anything else. They they demand a lot of work, 
And as a good parent, you want to give that because that is like the, the biggest accomplishment as a parent you can have. There's a lot of like, you know, ownership that you're like, okay, well, oh, that's my baby that's doing awesome. That's doing this or, or whatever. So they come down and they're just, you know, they're all in your face doing what they do, being kids, and it's awesome. But my point is, if I haven't gotten my stuff already wrapped up and, and taken care of at that point, now I walk into the office, now my anxiety levels are in the yellow, in the red, and this just compounds throughout the day. I'm probably already a little bit more tired. I'm not as flexible. I'm not as able to solve these problems for people that might need it. And then everything spirals downhill from there. And then what happens at nighttime, <clears throat> nighttime, you get completely thrown off because your daytime wasn't set up properly. And now I'm sitting here. This is going to be the nights where I'm like, I'm just dragging ass just to even get home because I drive an hour both ways to work. Okay. So I'm, I'm, dra I'm dragging ass just to even get home. And that's probably going to be the nights where I eat sh shittier food if I was going to do it. And that fucks me for the next day. And then there's inflammation. And then there's this. So it can definitely be a slippery slope, but it's been, it's been a long battle up and down along the way for that. And that was kind of long winded of me there. No, no, no. <laughs> I, uh, I, I kept getting transported when, when you were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, your children and, you know, how your daughters and early, uh, like wakes up early. And I'm thinking about this time when I was a kid where, you know, I spent a lot of time with one of my friends, not going to, not going to say who it is. Cause I don't want to get to put them on the spot, but their parents were always late sleepers. Um, and, and the kid was the first person to wake up in the household, you know, I'd be over there and, and, and we make breakfast or whatever. And the kid was very independent and everything like that. Um, but I was thinking to myself, like what you're, what you're doing, you know, starting your day, <clears throat> getting yourself kind of primed, essentially you're accomplishing what a lot of people do in a day earlier on, you know, you're, you're getting a good workout, you're getting a good pump in, you know, you're getting a little bit of purpose, a little bit of thought for your whole entire day with the book you know, you're doing your mindfulness and your, your breathing, like you said. Um, so really you're, I'm thinking to myself, well, really, if you, if you take your, your career, if you take your job serious, if you, if you think about, you know, the decisions and, and the mindset that you're going into to work, I mean, this, this should be, you know, the key to success. This, what, what you're talking about, you're really, you're making sure you're on your game a hundred percent. You're, you're, it's like, it's like you're warming up for the, for, for your job. Yeah, I, I would definitely say it, it, it is definitely a good warm up. And, you know, I think there's so many sayings around, you know, being successful in the morning, like early bird gets the worm and all that, that shit, it's for a reason. People knew that. And, <clears throat> you know, I make posts about it and, and some people will hate which I don't mind because me knowing what social media does, that gives me an algorithm bump when they do it. I won't get into that, right? But I'm cool when people send the hate but because, you know, they're like, what about night shift workers? What about this? What about that? And I'm like, you guys are taking things out of context. If you, you know, if you're, if you work at night, okay, well, that's your, that's your quote unquote daytime. That's your time, right? Humans were programmed to be awake in the daytime. That's why we have a circadian rhythm. That's why it goes with the sun and the sunset and the moon and this stuff, right? But <clears throat> if you wake up a little bit earlier than whatever your day is, man, you have time to set yourself up. And it definitely is the key to success. I don't know as many notable successful people that stayed up all night and woke up super late just because as opposed to people that woke up first thing in the morning and got all their stuff done and not to mention there is a 
like a peaceful blissfulness. Like it's 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 just dead quiet. You you are in your zone. You just woke up. You have whatever you're gonna have there, and you just like I would argue arguably say that somebody that does this, you know, what I'm doing, and I preached to everybody about how Elrod the Miracle Morning. That's where that's where a big start came from. Um, I don't do all the things that he does anymore, just because I I thought it was it was kind of creating a little bit of dysfunction by trying to do everything. But I think that's also part of it, like take the concept, the principle of all of that, and use it for what you need. But arguably, <clears throat> I would say that if somebody wakes up and gets what is your work day? Your work day is an eight hour day most days, right? For most people. If you wake up and you're three hours ahead of everybody else, holy fuck, like you've already got three hours of productivity before I start being productive. That's almost half of your work day. Like you compound that over time, man. And, and I actually heard a, a guy that I follow say this, uh, you know, you have, he obviously did the math on it. Um, he said, you have another full month almost at the end of a year of productivity, right? Kobe Bryant, same thing. He's like, if I'm, if I'm working out three times a day, like, and, and you're, you're not doing that. You're working out once and doing summer camps, doing this shit or whatever it is, you can't catch up. And that's the basis behind everything that I do. I don't give a shit what anybody does. If you want to be on the same page as me, you better start doing the stuff that I'm doing because, hey, I might not be exactly where I want to be yet. And I don't think I'll ever get there just because that's how humans are programmed. But I'm going to fucking leave anybody in the dust that's not willing to work as hard as I am. And the people that are willing to work as hard as, as I am, and some people work harder than I do, for sure they do. Those are the people that's going to get the shit that they want in this life, which you only have one of. That's the biggest, <clears throat> sorry, that's the biggest problem that I see. Is people are, are forgetting you only have one, and they waste their time hating on other people, talking shit on social media, and and not using things for the way that they should be. Right? That's the biggest problem that I see, and I'm like, fuck me, I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, you only got one chance at this, right? You get to raise kids once. You get to be a kid once. You get to be a grown up once. You get to do all this shit one time. You can fuck it up for a bit, but hey, you gotta get you gotta get your shit straight. So it's um, it's frustrating when you tell people, and then it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, and then they just you know, they they don't actually hear anything you say. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and I'm thinking like. <sighs> Yeah, there's always anomalies, right? There are those people that that can work whenever, but I think what you're what you're talking about is really just a template that will apply to everybody mostly. Like um yeah, yeah. you're going to have like those night owl like uh, you know, people that are into programming and they like to stay up, but truth be told, I mean, if you actually have like if you're if you're working and you have a schedule, I mean, you have to withhold that schedule you have to sleep certain times and wake up certain times and you know if you're, if you're in that kind of environment which most people are then everything that you're saying a hundred percent like you gotta you gotta get everything squeezed in between the nine to five all the other stuff right yeah a hundred percent and i was wondering um because you mm. you talked a, a little bit about and and we are i do want to talk about your fighting at some point but yeah, i think sure. i think what's really interesting is what's have been going on after the the fighting and everything like that but uh yeah. to what extent did because because you, you hear all the time you know fighters <clears throat> they could do their road work early in the morning was there any element of that that kind of brought you to this early morning um routine like trying to get you because because a lot of fighters they'll do like their their morning runs or or yeah. anything like that was, was that a, an element at all you know what? I haven't actually given much thought to that before. That's a, that's a great question because I've always been I've always been a morning person. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but yeah, getting up and 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 going for that morning run 
that was always the thing. Even before I was a fighter, I would, I, I loved, I always loved running. Uh, now after fighting, I, I don't run the best anymore because my ankles are fucking rigid. <laughs> I'm working on them with, um, over at proactive there with Dr. Warren. He's, he's awesome. But, um, yeah, I don't run as much anymore, but yeah, that, I mean, that, that definitely kind of primes you to be that, that morning person to, to get out and do it at that time. There's, you know, there's also a lot of stuff. Like if you work out late at night, your core temperature is higher that, you know, there, it's just, it's just a fact that like you have to get your core temperature lower and the low, like if, if it's uh, not the lower it is, obviously if it's too low, you're fucking dead. So don't take it out of context here, right? For anybody that's going to hate on me later on. But, you know, you get a lower core temperature, you have a better sleep. That's why they have things like the chili pad, which I am getting one for my birthday. I'm pretty pumped Ooh. for that. So, you know, no big deal. But um, When's your birthday? In, in June. For, in June, okay. Birthday, but, I, but I keep talking about the chili pad here with my wife, so I keep waiting <laughs> it up. I'm just one of those guys. I'm like, ah, oh, it's hot in there. It's in the chili pad. <laughs> yeah. But That's good. getting getting up and getting out your your um, getting your workout in first thing in the morning that sets you up again. Yeah, it, it sets you up for success right off the bat. And it also there's a lot of links to having better sleep by having your workout done around seven o'clock in the morning. Now, don't don't uh, obviously there's three or four more workouts in the day going on if you're a professional fighter or whatever the case is, but I, I think that it's a pretty well-known fact that you are healthy when you are a fighter, when you are a competitor, when you are all these things, but you're, there's also a level that you are almost a little bit past the point of, of, of being healthy. Like you, you have to push it, <clears throat> right? That's why usually there's, you know, you're with doctors, you're doing this and you're, you're, you're constantly, um, a lot of people have sponsors that, and, and I was lucky to have one that was a physiotherapist, chiropractor, and things of that nature, because you're fucking yourself up a lot, because you're pushing past the point of optimization, right? Like, you are, like, if that even makes sense, but you, you know what I mean? It like, makes sense to way, me, yes. Yeah, on the way to being, like, the, the top notch and getting your cardio and uh, your mindset and all of these things and your skills developed and being the best person that you can be in the ring or on the mat or whatever it is that that you're doing, you have to push <clears throat> you have to push the boundaries and push past because you have to red line. You have to you know, you have to get to that the, the pinnacle and actually go past where it would be almost healthy. Because right? You don't have, you can't sustain it. You can't just sustain, Jesus Christ, you can't sustain that peak. You can't, right? So you have to almost like peak and push yourself past the point of anything to get to that peak. And you don't want to peak at the wrong time. And then you wean it back because, and then you're at like homeostasis. You just, <clears throat> you're in a good spot. That is when you are the most like healthy. You know what I mean? Your body fat's not too low. You're not pushing too crazy hard. That is kind of the point there where I would say you're the most you're the most healthy. I think we geared off on a bit of a tangent there. No, no. But, um, this will then bring it to just in general is something a background that I'd like to talk about. Uh, what got you into fighting? Because you obviously have been a fighter for quite some time. You know MMA and Brazilian jiu-jitsu competitions, boxing competitions. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about your journey so far and how you got into martial arts? Um, so I was really small as a kid. Right? I was really <laughs> tiny, but I was, you know, I got an Irish background, so uh -huh. I didn't care. I was just like, let's fucking go. Right? So <laughs> um, I was never, so don't think it's going to be like, I was like, oh, I was picked on and I was bullied. That is shitty when it happens to people. I was attempted to, I would, they, they would attempt to pick on me and I would just be the first one to start throwing my hands. I'd be like, Ooh. well, fuck you, right? So 
um, that's kind of how I, I grew up. I was fighting every weekend. I was fighting all the time there. So, um, and me and my friends, like my, my really good, he's like my brother, uh, Joey Laviolette. He, okay. Uh, yeah. Like me and him grew up, but we were, we, we learned, he's been my best friend since I was like 10 years old. Right, wow. so me, him, his brother, and shit. We would go in the backyard and we would box with just winter gloves on and <laughs> just beat the shit out of each other. Right? Oh man, I remember one time we were, we were going and for whatever reason, like you know, Joe's younger than me still too, right? Obviously, he's a couple hmm. years younger than me, and uh, I think he's like two two years younger than me. Anyways, he was like trying to like. I had him against the the actual fence, right? So okay. somebody's actual fence and throwing a couple of punches and he turned the truck right away. Right? Bang! Just gave him a shot right in the face. But it was, these are winter gloves. Like, the, you know, it's nothing, there's no padding. So, uh, you know, like fighting in general. And we were in the boxing gym. He, he, he stayed consistent with that. I did not. Uh, I went and fought outside. I street fought a lot, right? So where he was in the gym doing his thing, I was coming and going and, you know, just thought I was a tough guy and whatever. Just <clears throat> had a chip on my shoulder at that time. But, uh, yeah, I was always in and out of the boxing gym. I really wasn't totally sold on boxing, to to be honest. I'm a, I'm a fucking lanky guy and by the time i was you know 15 or 16 that's when i kind of shot up and fucking you know had these <laughs> lanky limbs i could barely fucking run at the time but i always wanted to kick i was always super super flexible love jean claude van damme he was the fucking yes. man he that was my idol right so um you know fuck how do you beat this big fucking donkey that he fought there if I could throw shit in his eyes and he, uh, and, you know still beats the guy right I thought that guy was fucking awesome so kicking was something that I was like I always wanted to kick I always wanted to kick right <clears throat> um I don't know how much you know about the next part before I got into MMA but I I ended up going to prison there for a little over two years right I don't know too much about it, and I was wondering if it was something we could talk about. Sure, sure. So it all kind of went together. It all stemmed together. And basically, and I don't, I don't even talk about it much unless I'm in, so that's like, unless I'm in this scenario. Yes. Because it's been, I was 21 years old. I'm 35 now, right? I'm, I'm actually going through the pardon process now as a grown-up, if you will, right? Of course. <clears throat> but I would say my that, that my path on that started because um, I used to be high honors student, the whole fucking works. And then I just had a few things that happened, and there's always two ways that someone's going to go. You're either going to take it and, and use it and – constructive and productive and do something that's going to benefit you or you're going to go the other way and at that point in my life i went the other way you know i wasn't i wasn't mentally developed enough yet and i i felt like you know my family we, we weren't well off so <clears throat> my mom got cancer and for the most well for the most part she was in the hospital the whole time she was extremely sick she she made it, so I'll put that out quick, just so that you know people can have a little bit of relief as we're as we're talking. She's you know, she's still fucking her old crazy self, right? So that's good. And along that that journey there, that's kind of when things started switching up for me. And you know, I can say whatever I want. It, I, I probably could have done other things, but at that time, I felt like it was necessity. And, uh, you know, I started selling drugs at a really, really young age. And that was kind of, that was kind of the trajectory that I was on at that point, right? I was like, okay, my dad was in there with my mom at the hospital all the time. Um, he couldn't really work that much. So <clears throat> he's in, you know, and that's it. He's fighting for the woman. Like, 
they don't know what they're doing. You, you, I know this as a parent now. You, like you're sitting there, and you know you've got these kids. They think that you've got your shit together, like you got it all figured out, but you don't. Everybody's just trying to figure it out. And at that point, for them, what was happening was, you know, my dad. My dad is like one of the guys that's like. He fucking loves my mom to death, right? And that's like such an admirable quality that he has. He's just he's just one of those fucking guys. He, he just wants to come go to work, come home, and 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 his wife be there, right? That's a. I mean, he drinks every day, but <laughs> he's still he's, <laughs> he's he's awesome, right? Fucking best friends with my dad. But at that point, <clears throat> he was not able to work. Like, I think it was more mental than anything. He would only be able to work so long, right? And then I think it was more mental than anything. Then he would be like, okay, I like go spend time and be in there with, with my mom, obviously, which, mm-hmm. which is fine. That's, you know, I see that now. But what was going on on the other side of things, and, you know, they try to apologize to us all the time for this. And I'm like, man, it's, it's good, right? But what's going on on the other side, look, on the other side of the coin is that, now you've got two kids there that one's spiraling out of control. He's, you know, I'm selling drugs. I'm, I'm not even really showing up at school anymore. If I am, I'm just fucking, you know, baked all the time. And, you know, and my sister, she's trying her hardest to try and keep me intact. But I'm just uh, fucking, you know, <clears throat> I already loved fighting before. Now I'm a drug dealer. Now I'm like, you know, I think I'm fucking you know, cough and walk there. So I just want to fight everybody all the time and just, <clears throat> just a loose cannon. So my, my grades slipped. I ended up still graduating. Um, I ended up still graduating from, uh, from high school. So at that point, I'm kind of starting to, starting to spiral out of control a little bit there. And she's really trying, she's trying to help me. My sister's awesome, but older she's sister also, or younger? Older, older. Okay. Yeah. Three years older than I am. She's. I have the same. I'm the same. My sister's yeah. three years older. Yeah. So she's man. She did so much shit for me back then that I, you know, like I kind of forget about sometimes and take for granted a little bit. But she was working her job and and just trying to help, trying to provide, trying to do all these things. And I'm not even like. I'm not even thinking that, she, like, I don't even give a fuck that she's trying to help me out at the time. It didn't even matter. I didn't even comprehend that at all. But, um, so through all of this stuff, you know, she's still going through everything. And basically, that's when the spiral is, is in full effect. I barely finished, barely finished high school. Um, by the, by the end of high school, I'm kind of done the moat and, um, now just a full-time full-time hustler right my mom's back she's <clears throat> she's healthy again at this point right but i'm just too far gone i'm uh, you know i'm doing ecstasy and partying all the time and, and still fighting and you know getting getting close to the point where i was carrying a gun all the time not at that point yet but it was it was getting close to it so you know a couple years couple of years down the road and then yeah i'm starting to walk around carrying the gun and for for what reason you know i had problems because i was being a fucking little shit but i don't know if they were the problems i think i was the problem <laughs> it was was the thing there i don't know if anybody else was really going to come at me or something like that but i was prepared to to do what i had to do if they did which might have been a little bit more than i think people were prepared to do on the other side. So I was just <clears throat> hanging with some bad people, the whole works. It just seemed normal, right? Um, go to jail, right? So here we go. Let's go to prison. <laughs> so cops kick our door in and um, they, they raid us, find some blow, find some handguns. And um, so what it was, was guys sold handguns. We ended up in possession of them. They stole them from a cop's house. 
Oh no. And they, and they got caught. And then <clears throat> and then they told. There you go. So they told and they were like, this is where you can find them. So they came when they came to find all the guns, they found other stuff as well. But uh, I will tell you, I had my I had my phone off, and this is back in the day when the cop stuff was still on the um, what is that thing? The C, like the CD radio? Yes. <clears throat> this is before they went like encrypted and all that fucking shit. My buddy, I come to find out a couple of years later on down the road. He's like, man, he's like, I was fucking calling you because Whoa. they said your address. They were coming. They were going to raid that address, this and that. And I was like, ah, oh. but you know what? It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, <clears throat> not at first. I went in, you know, nervous, but uh, got in there, got in a fight the first 24 hours, and then started settling in, <laughs> you know, and then went to a different range, uh, got in a fight there, and uh, I beat Buddy pretty badly in, in that one. Yeah, uh, over something so fucking stupid. It's just it was over nothing. He was they were just like they were they were smoking a joint, right? And they were trying to spray, you know, you take like coconut, like the hair coconut oil yes. and um and water. They were spraying it. I'm like I'm like in the shower, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> it's got, don't, why? Why, right? Anyways, <clears throat> I ended up getting lipping off that buddy there, and then we closed. Had to go to our cells. The doors opened back up, and I had been in there with a buddy of mine. He's like, "Who's passed away now?" But he's like, "He thinks he's pumping you off right now." I was like, "Motherfucker!" <laughs> so, anyways, doors open up. I went over to his cell, said something to him. He got up, and I beat the piss out of him. But you know, I was definitely in the wrong in that situation. There, I shouldn't have fucking shouldn't have done that. That was a dick thing to do. You know, and then I go, and this is in the county, then I go to Federal. So now I'm in Spring Hill. And what they do in, in, in those situations, I don't know if you know. Is I don't. They put, you, they put you in an area called reception at the time. I don't know if it's okay. changed, changed any now. But they put you in an area called reception, and they classify you. And I was supposed to, when I got charged, go to a, mini, a minimum minimum security prison and uh just through being a dick and being who i was at the time i i cascaded straight past the medium security went straight to the maximum security so okay. i was supposed to do six months out of this i got three years and 16 days sentence right so i was supposed to do six months because when you're in there on just drug charges uh, or something non-violent, mm -hmm. and they they fast track you is what they call it. So you do like one sixth of your time or whatever. Anyways, it, it equated to me doing <clears throat> six months. But once I cascaded up to maximum security, then you don't get that option anymore. So I ended up doing a little over two years, mm -hmm. and in that time, you know. Throughout this time, it, it started, once I got to the match, I was pulling up there, and that's when I was like, I fucked up. Like, now I know. Now I'm like, shit. I got out, and, you know, everything was good. People, people liked me. They thought I was fucking funny. And, um, <clears throat> but what's going on inside of my body is that, you know, I'm not on the drugs anymore. I'm not fucking, I, I'm not that guy i'm turning back into like this wholesome fucking funny kid that i used to be before everything was going crazy and i'm realizing that you know i'm like oh shit i'm like i i don't know if, <laughs> i don't know if i can you know if i'm the same as these guys because there's people there like they're you know there's there's murderers there that's that's where they're going right this is the worst of the worst in the maximum security so it's all fine. Then a riot breaks out at, at one point there. And if you've never been in a riot, which I'll just assume that you haven't. No, not yet. Um, <clears throat> not yet. Just try to stay away from it, right? <laughs> just, just so you know, it's it's probably the single 
scariest thing that you can ever go through. And, and what had happened was a friend of mine had come up and people wanted to kill him. They had a, they had an issue with him. Well, I'm his friend. So they now have an issue with me as well. Um, so fucking riot ends up happening. It's like one of the fucking, it, you know, I, I say it's one of the craziest just because I was only there for that one. But man, they're fucking, <clears throat> it's just like what you would think in a fucking, in, in, in some type of fucking movie. All the, the lights, they're beat out. There's like the, like the shit's just hanging from the fucking ceilings. There's the guards up in their little bubble area up there. There's a blanket across. Um, everybody is dressed the exact same. They've got their institutional clothes on. Um, and there's like everybody's got a mask on their face and over their head and shit like that. So you can't tell who is who is, is the theory behind it, right? And <clears throat> the guards are, so they shoot this, this stuff with like a shotgun but it's like coming out of a canister and it's, um, it's, it's like the, uh, like the tear gas type of shit. So this are <laughs> they're just fucking lacing that shit down the hallways and stuff. It hit me in the leg with one of them at, at one point. Didn't really hurt, but it did happen. So I like to just throw that out there. <laughs> and, you know, I took one to the leg. Yes. So, and they're, they're taking this stuff, it's called like OC spray, and it's like the stronger tear gas that they use oh. outside. They're leaking that in through the window. So you can't breathe. Shit's all fucked up. You know, everything's crazy. It's dim. And you're just like, okay, what's going on? So me and my buddy are sitting there. Nothing's really popping off at this, this time. I didn't think that, like, <clears throat> didn't think anything was really happening. So it's okay. And then, on the what I don't didn't realize was that on the other ranges there they had broken through the top range down to the bottom range oh. and then you hear it on the other side and this is when I realized I was like okay I was like so so they had uh, I'll preface this a little bit they had a big metal desk they had ripped it out of one of the uh, out of one of the rooms and you just all of a sudden you hear oh. And there's a door in between us and them. And there's 40, 40 guys on the other side. Mm -hmm. And what I asked, I said to my buddy, I was like, what do you think's going on right now? He's like, they get through, they're going to fucking kill the both of them. And <clears throat> I said, fuck. It doesn't matter. There's not, nowhere you can go on a ride anyways. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you do. You can fucking you can say, hey, how? That doesn't fucking matter. You, it, so... There's nothing you can do. So I made pizzas and played chess. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I was literally dumped out of it. I was like, I really don't know what the fuck to do right now other than just see if this, they come through the door and then try and defend ourselves. That's the only thing that I can, can really think to do. So there's a bang, 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 bang. And this went on and on for a while, right? We were just sitting there, just in the in the common room and the other guys that were on our range <clears throat> they were down the end of the hallway just all of them just kind of like sitting there waiting just these guys come through then it's just like <clears throat> this is the this is what this is my truth this is the reality that i hear mm -hmm. now whether this was actually going to happen i don't know right never did right they didn't get through because the whole time they're sitting there doing that, the, the guards are boom, boom, boom. And then they're spraying them with, uh, they'll have like a big fire hose in there on a turret. Ooh. And they're fucking soaking them fucking with that and shit like that. And <clears throat> so nothing ends up coming about. Go to my cell, close the door. Fuck. Okay. And then the, everything's locked down end up in the hole for fucking, I ended up in, in segregation from that riot for 11 months straight. And then that is where a lot of changes came in my life. Okay. 
you know, your, your toughest enemy is yourself, right? And until you are in a spot where you can sit there and actually, you know, you, you can't get out and there's, there's, there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. You, yeah, you, you know, you can have it. You got a TV in there, but <clears throat> it's not as appetizing as it fucking sounds. You sit there and just, you know, you got a TV on at a certain point. There's, it's just nothing, right? So you're just sitting there. It's almost probably be better if you didn't have a TV for your brain, right? Mm-hmm. right? Knowing, knowing what I know now and how I am now, I would probably prefer not to have a TV if I was in that situation again. So, you know, 11 months, you you go through a lot of fucking shit. And there was just like, at, at a point, like, <clears throat> I don't even want to go out to wreck. Like, I don't even want to go to the yard. I'm just like, I'm turning into a fucking bug. I'm starting to go a little bit fucking crazy down there, right? And, and you know, I, I there's there was a guy across the hall from me. He hung himself, um, <clears throat> you know? So you see this shit. Um, that's the second person that I had seen hang themselves since I had been in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you don't actually, like, I can see a little bit, but I can't, I, I'm not like looking over and being like watching and seeing him do this. I'm just like, like I can look over once the guards are going in, they open the door because they're like, oh, fuck, oh, trying, you know, cut people down. Mm-hmm. And um, it happened in reception as well. But he got in. He, he he hung himself in there with his sheets. So this was, you know, I'm I'm in the hole, starting to lose my mind. People are killing themselves. I'm just like, what the fuck? And <clears throat> you know, I didn't get that parole that I was thinking. So I'm just I'm fucking nuts. Like I'm just like literally starting to I'm starting to bug out. I'm starting to have a tough time, right? I'm like uh, I I like. Like, I'm sitting there thinking about, there was, you know, I'm like, fuck, man. Like there was there was definitely a day or two where I thought, I was like, I should just fucking, I should just do the same. Because you don't see the end. And that is the only situation where I could ever think, because I am so against any of that. But that's the only situation where I can ever relate to somebody actually being like, and understand why someone killed themselves. I'm like, they just don't know. They just don't understand what they're doing. They don't see a way out. And there's just like no light at the end of the tunnel. So I get out of the hole. I'm out, walking around, making friends, whatever. It's fine. And still in jail. <clears throat> but, you know, it's okay. And then uh, what ended up happening? Got caught with some fucking shanks or something like that back in the fucking hole for another month and then I get out of the hole and um, <laughs> the fucking there's this, there's this guy there, I can't remember his name man he was a cool cat um, he, was, he was he was black but he was albino uh, he had big, he had a big yeah like he had a big red afro too right and he had size okay. bob tattooed on his arm like he embraced, he embraced it for sure, man. I called him Blanca. I was like, dude, you look like fucking buddy from Street Fighter. Just fucking jacked like that, right? And moat for breakfast. You know, <clears throat> not not a lot of people really got out and went to breakfast. So I'm out going to breakfast, and one guy just didn't like, you know, what was going on with with this fella, uh, 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 Sideshow Bob. We'll just say that for now because I can't remember his fucking name. That sucked. And I wish I could because he deserves me to remember his name. He deserves that respect. Um, anyways, I, I hear I hear Sideshow running up. He said, Sully, Sully. <laughs> and, and he couldn't beat this guy himself. I don't know why he did. I don't know why he's running up calling my name. I'm still a scrawny little runt at the time, right? And uh, <clears throat> my door is actually closing. And then I hear him, Sully, Sully. And I was like, I look out, but he's chasing them down the hallway with a fucking, um, I come to find out later on, it was like a, like a, an adapter and a pair of socks and fucking chasing them all. I come out the fucking thing and 
<laughs> fucking, you know, I actually didn't even think that I hit the guy, but apparently the tapes stay different, so I did. Didn't get charged for it or anything like that, but I was back in the hole for another two months, and then I was released from I was released from the hole. Um, and then then I got out. So when I got out, um, I was as white as the crispest whitest t-shirt you've ever put on my eyes my eyelids were red like just like there was no I had no color nothing at all so I get out and my buddy picks me up and he's just like what well, and this is my best friend right like I fucking we, me and him been best friends since we were like two years old <clears throat> so he picks me up and you know he's got some friends of mine there too and they're just like they're thinking they, you know, they thought I was going to walk out this fucking jack fucking, you know, mess. I walked out. I'm scrawny as shit. Fucking couldn't work out. Couldn't do anything. <laughs> I got no color to my face. They're just a fucking mess, right? Um, but I got out, and that's when I was like, okay, shit's got to fucking change. Uh, I had myself credit-wise. I was fucked. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had 210 bucks to my name for the body bag that I didn't use. Mm -hmm. Right. So they gave me back that money, you know, nice guys. And, uh, took me a minute to figure it out. Cause I, I was still on parole. Once I was done parole, I went out to the oil rigs. I completely flipped my life around out there. I needed that so bad. And I went out <clears throat> and I was making killer money right off the banger too. So, you know, Went out, made like, I think my first two week paycheck was like 6,500 bucks after tax, right? I was like, I can deal with this. So, stayed up there for a while. Completely just, I, I bought one host and I bought another host. And then I just started kind of turning into a different type of person while I was okay. up there. You know, mindset was, mindset was kind of changing. I came back here. Um, when the oil started going down, <clears throat> opened up uh, a company with uh, me and my buddies there, uh, started getting some more real estate and things like that. So now after a little bit of time, and this is what I tell people, I'm like, you know, they're like, and I actually had a, a young, young girl that I worked with the other day. She's having a tough go. And she said, mm -hmm. yeah, but you have money. I said, I didn't always, I, and I want you to understand this. I was like, I put in a lot of fucking time. Like, this is the thing. People see the overnight success. I'm like, you you don't know. And I don't I don't want to preach to people. Be like, you don't know what I went through, but you don't know what anybody's gone through. Right? You don't know what Gary Vee has gone through. You don't know what fucking um, Jay Shetty has gone through. Any of those people. You don't know. You just hear it. And even this, me telling you all these stories that I just have is going to be an hour, 45 minutes of some people's life. And then they're going to hear the last part where I'm like, yeah, now, yeah, now I've got a, no, I've got a really nice home. I'm building another home. I have a very good job. I drive nice cars. I, you know, but I put the work in when it needed to be put in and I made sure that I corrected the stuff that needed to be corrected. And what I now know is that if you have a proper mindset, that there's nothing like you hear people say it and it's so fucking true. Like Will Smith, he said this, he's like, if you just decide, the universe is going to get out of your way that's always stuck with me because it's so true. People are like, what, what do you mean? Like, just decide. I'm like, you have to figure out what it is that you're deciding first before you just like, you can't half ass it. That's not decided. That's not saying like, okay, like let's go for it. I know what I'm doing. I knew I wanted to be in sales. I knew I was going to be the fucking general manager. I knew that I'm going to have a fucking podcast and I knew that I was going to have always have at least a six figure fucking income. I have never, not had a six figure income since the fucking, since the moment I got off parole. And that is because I fucking decided to. And that is the biggest thing that people need to understand. Overnight success is not real. 
but you make your own fucking, you make your own life, you make your own reality. And if you think that you are destined for something, you need to go for it. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. Because people, people are negative by nature and they honestly actually want you to fail. That is the biggest problem about a lot of things there. People focus their time on people that don't deserve it. Right? They've got all these people around them, you know, that secretly want these people to fail. You need to keep, if you are doing something big, keep it to yourself and just do it. Don't fucking, like, you, you can tell some people to keep you honest, to make sure you do it, but keep it to yourself because the worst thing that you can have is someone's opinion that stops you in your tracks from doing what you really want to do. Hey, thank, I, I thank you for sharing that that story of, about you know i know it probably was really difficult to talk about just because i um as you said it was quite a long time ago and i'm sure you're trying to not so much focus on it but get it, yeah, yeah. yeah um and the one thing that 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 kind mm -hmm. of occurred to me while you were talking is a little bit about once you got out of um maximum maximum security prison um can you talk a little bit about how people treat, um, you know, ex cons and, and maybe the process that, you know, obviously some people might have, uh, you know, judged yeah. you for what you did when you at a young age. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how you've been able to come to peace and to come to terms with that past and, and how you've been able to move forward? So I think that the process keeps it, it limits people when you get out of prison there's you know there's also no bettering uh process while you're in prison so you just waste time in, in canadian jails like they that's why i think it's more of a business than anything and it 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 costs the taxpayers about 60 to seventy five thousand dollars per person that's in there taxpayers money per year but there's nothing that's happening for these people while they're in there. And I get it. People, you know, people can have their opinions and say, ah, oh, fuck, they're a criminal, do this or that. And yeah, maybe they were, but you've got people that are in there for 10 plus years. And when they get out, then what? Then don't you want that person to be somebody that is going to be um, uh, able to be a trusted person in the community at one point, maybe not right away. Don't you want that person to be able to contribute? And this is, this is the biggest problem is that you get out of prison, <clears throat> but you are still confined by a lot of social aspects of what you're able to do. The parole system there, you can't, you know, you, you can't actually have if you don't have some type of connection to a friend who has a business or something of that nature, holy fuck, man, it's, it's difficult because you'll have to leave work to go, you know, go check in or go talk to someone or something of that nature, or you'll have a program that you have to do and you'll have to do that every Wednesday or you'll have to do it every, every so often. Some people have to, and they'll have to like go back every two hours. I get it. They've earned that distrust um, in the eyes of the correctional system. That is the process that they have made. And that's kind of, they want to make sure that this dangerous type of person is coming in back and showing face and you know what kind of trouble can you get in two hours i get that but at the same time you have not given this person the tools to better themselves to be anything but what they were you tell them to get out get a job um but they have to do all of these extra things where you know some employers might be like you know what i don't think i have time for that you know so <clears throat> It has, for me personally, I had to rebuild some relationships with people. They didn't trust me. 
but I'm like, like you said at the start, I'm a bit of an anomaly. I'm a little bit of a different type of person because I have this unique ability about me to talk to people and, you know, they trust me pretty quickly because usually like, they're like, man, there's just something about you. That's usually what I end up hearing. They're like, they're like, man, you're like a fucking therapist. Like, you know, people just end up talking to me and it's why I'm very good at my job. And it's why I will never, ever go without having a fantastic job because of that ability to talk to people them trust me and me to be able to solve problems. That is what I've realized in my life. But I think for the majority of people, yeah, it, it's, it's very limited. It's very tough. And I don't think that the system is set up properly for people not to reoffend. I think the system is set up intentionally for them to reoffend. If, if, if that makes any sense there, because, you know, it, especially in the United States, it's, it's so much a privatized business as well. Um, I don't know how it could be better other than just giving people opportunities while they're in jail to better themselves. That's going to be a very sticky topic because like I said, people are like, fuck you, you're in jail, you deserve to be in there. So <clears throat> there's always two sides to it, but you know, would, if I was to talk to any of those type of people that are like, well, why would you give them the opportunity when they're in jail? Like, then I, I would just kind of question them. Well, would you want that same type of person walking freely without any type of skills in the same mindset, in the same place that they were before, um, you know, ready to do the, the same shit for survival or whatever it was that they did back when they committed the offense because essentially if <clears throat> if you think that somebody is going to do something extraordinary outside of what they know you know usually that doesn't fucking happen that's what they know that's what's comfortable that's what's easy that's what comes to you so it's just like okay i can do this and it wasn't given any more skills and in fact you might have less skills when you get out because you don't really age in there. It's just a bunch of fucking kids, pretty much. Like, guys, we're fucking retarded. Like, you know, a bunch of guys hanging out together all the time. All it is, you you stay at a certain fucking immature age, and you can possibly get some very good connections for whatever your trade is. If you're a bank robber, if you're a fucking if whatever your situation. So I think that the system is very flawed. <clears throat> do I have all the answers on how to fix it? No, I don't. For me personally, it, it hasn't held me back from as much as I think it does a lot of other people though. And, and thank you again for, for sharing that. And I wanted to, to kind of move now to maybe a little bit of a brighter topic. Um, sure. So well, let's get break. You're, you're the general manager mm -hmm. at uh, East coast financing and um, I East Coast Financing uh, has been supporting a lot of the local um, fight clubs like Citadel Boxing and their promotions. You know, I've seen, uh, you know, fighters like Gavin Tucker uh, from, from the UFC talking about it. Um, of course, I've also seen like Pat Stay, you know, doing commercials for, yeah. for East Coast Financing. Um, I want to venture and say that you guys, as far as your, um, you know, your outreach, as far as, you know, promoting yourself, you guys are doing probably the best job in this area as far as like getting all these wonderful branches of, of parts of Nova Scotia and really like incorporating it. And I was just wondering, is this any part to do with, with what you're doing with the company? Like, cause I know, you know, all, all these people that I just spoke about. Can, can you talk a little bit about that process? So the, uh, the owner of the company is, is somebody that fully believes in like the power of like the universe and things like that. And is one of the, the most giving people I've ever met. So he wants to give back to the community consistently. Um, Gavin Tucker is, you know, somebody that 
when when I was there, he reached out, we chatted and whatnot, and I set him up with uh, Daniel at East Coast Farm. Dan, Daniel is the owner. Okay. Um, Daniel knew uh, Daniel knew Pat. Um, I actually did some filming there the other day on. Yes, the, congratulations. On the, uh, so, uh, I think we were talking last time. I was like, I'm trying to get down to TV time stuff going on there. Yes. So that was super cool. But you know, we are always giving back to charities. We're always giving to the SBCA, and the point is, like a lot of you know, very prominent people, they, they fully believe in the, the power of, of giving, you know, <clears throat> and you don't just give to receive, but it is a big part of it. So if you're not willing to give back to the community and you're just kind of like greedy, 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 just taking everything, well, that's, you know, that's bad karma too, right? There's people out there that need stuff more than you do along the way. So it's super important to be giving back, but it's also pretty cool to have, these caliber of people out there um, promoting East Coast financing as well. Like, you know, Pat doing his hilarious videos that he does all the time. Like, guy's a maniac. So his, his videos <laughs> are just hilarious, right? And then, you know, that like Gavin Tucker out there, this guy is, is such a stud in the, the, uh, the USC world right now. I know he's got his shoulder tore, but uh, speedy recovery, I'm sure, and he'll be right back to it. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, really, I, I think it's just, yeah, I think it's just ingrained in everything that is East Coast financing. That is the company that we want to build as we go up. And, and uh, yeah, like the whole inner workings of it is like, if you are a person that tries to come in and bring negativity into this company, you're not going to be there long. Right. If you're somebody that's a, a bad apple, if you're just like you don't drive, you're, you know, you're talking shit, you're just not being a good person. Well, then, you know, hey, you might you might be a great salesperson. You might be all these great things, but we got to let you go. Right. It, this is just kind of how we are. So everything is given back. Everything is positivity. And I know some people are going to be like, well, oh, that's fucking horse shit. And you know what? Those are the people that won't find a job at East Coast Finance. Right? So those are the negative people that can be on the sidelines while we're doing all these really cool stuff. And there's so much more. Like this company is just really kind of getting going, but there's so much more stuff <clears throat> that we want to do and that we will be doing here in the near future. We just haven't done yet. So you can't do everything all at once, right? So. And you certainly like – with it, all the videos, like, cause you, you post quite a bit on social media. Yes. Um, you do, you do some social media at work. It seems like you're able to really, you know, hone in on and, and be yourself, you know, in this company. And it's really beautiful. And I hope more companies take note of that because, you know, sometimes with like the corporate structure and the way that a lot of yeah. companies run their stuff, they don't allow people to do this type of stuff. And I really think it adds a level of authenticity and you know, personal personableness to sure. to the yeah. brand and to the company. Um, can you talk a little bit now about um, when you started posting? Because um, we talked obviously about your story and a little bit about the fighting aspect too. But can you can you talk about when you started posting and some more motivational content and and how that began? And because you do a, a wonderful job. I mean, I'm I'm always looking in to your uh to your reels and and finding a lot of inspiration so can you talk a little bit about that honestly i started <clears throat> doing more and more of that based off of <clears throat> a couple different factors just because i know that social media is huge right now and it's kind of the way to get yourself out there but it's also deflating a little bit sometimes when you don't get any traction on something that you put out um and I talked, I, like I'm a team lead. I have these meetings every single day with my people and I'm always saying all of this type of stuff and, and from all the books that I'm reading and, you know, quotes and this and that. So it all kind of spiraled into that. And I was like, you know what? Like, I really want to be putting this out there. I didn't fully know how to do it with the social media aspect for a while. And I still really am not the best, not the way I want to be. But what I've come to realize is different than what I thought before. So what I mean by that is 
I thought if I was going to be posting, you know, three and four times a day, that it was desperate and that I was like trying too hard. But then come to find out this is the way to get stuff moving. And it just constantly keeps your films at the top of people's feeds. So it actually helps you bump in the algorithm. But the thing that I've come to realize as well is that <clears throat> that's the type of person that I am. I love motivating people. I love getting people going. And I can get much more traction by helping people out as opposed to them, as opposed to me saying, hey, come buy this car from me at East Coast Financing. Because that doesn't work. That's a very naive way to do it and paid ads. And this is where I started, so I know. Right? Yes. And it was very naive of me to think that because people know me and, oh, yeah, no, you know, I'm in a fighter and this and that, that I could just post <clears throat> and they would be like, oh, cool, let's go down there. And it doesn't work like that. So I had to start taking the things, you know, obviously developing and learning, but taking the things that I love talking about and well, hoping that it was stuff that people would jive with, but really just starting to flood it and put it out there and just getting as, you know, trying to get as much traction as I can. And lately it's been, it's been starting to pay off more and more. So, and it also feeds into an addiction as well. <laughs> right? Because at that point you start seeing, you're like, okay, I was fucking right. I knew it. Right? So then that's when, you know, that's why I'm happy now to be like, okay, I am going to get this, like I was doing the FLA podcast and stuff like that there mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, right now they've got a lot of stuff going. So it's been, you know, I did a couple episodes and then mm -hmm. just things here and there. Brian's well, super busy. Um, but it, I even said this to, to Kat. I was like, well, you know what? I was like, I had the, my moments on, on the podcast and I, I, it let me know that I love it. So now seeing all the social media stuff popping off and I'm like, okay, what are the big dogs doing? You know, taking all the podcast stuff, repurposing those videos yes. and then putting that onto your social media and taking little snippets of, you know, from this year, there's going to be, and you can have several weeks of little 15 minute, 20 or, or 20 or 20 second things that we have said back and forth that people will vibe with that you can be putting out two and three clips a day. So then it's like, okay, it's not more work. It's more efficient work. Yes. So it, it just all works together. And, you know, while you're doing this again, you're getting better, you're honing your craft, you're starting to be more efficient at this. So, you know, people always ask me, like, man, how are you, like, putting it, you're going to do that too? I'm like, I'm going to do that, but it all works together. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need to be out there coming up with as many, as many real ideas if I have a podcast that has three different camera angles, which I'm setting up right now in East Coast Financing, right? Okay. So, yeah, yeah, no no big deal. It's going to be coming out here soon. So I ordered the stuff, uh, the last part of the stuff yesterday, and I've got uh, a couple really, really knowledgeable guys that just, if you want to do something, if you decide, people start coming into your life. So yes. um DJ Pete Savory there. He works at uh, he works at our place. Awesome at like uh, video editing. Another guy that just came in, John Hoskins. He's like, yeah, that's my thing. I was like, what? So <clears throat> it just ends up happening. But all of these things are going to work together and just make everything that much better. Hey, I'm really, I'm really excited to to hear that things are moving on the podcast. Um, but by the way, first of all, uh, you did a really good job on the episodes I've seen you, uh, the Fight League Atlantic podcast, and I'm really happy that you know you're you're now thinking about also doing your own podcast. 
Can you just give uh, the listeners here a little bit of a preview of what to expect, what kind of topics you want to focus on in that podcast? And by sure. the way, I do yeah. I do know that we are running um, t- time wise, uh, so maybe we'll we'll end kind of with that, and then we'll do our. So yeah, can you t- just talk a little sure. bit about uh, you know what yeah. what to expect? Okay, so firstly, I'm going to tell them you can find me on Instagram at the real Bradley Sullivan. Hit me up there. You can catch me on TikTok too, doing, you know, trying to trying to do stuff over there. Um the podcast, I, I'm not a hundred percent of the name yet. I've got a couple names that I was whirling around in my head there. I want, you know, something to play off like the Ed Sullivan show, like the Brad Sullivan uh-huh. show, or possibly East Coast perspectives. A couple things that I'm kind of just swirling around in my head, but it's going to be based off of what I think, you know, Canada was built on. And that's just like the entrepreneurial aspect of the, the people out there that are getting after it. Like people think salespeople, but that's not like salespeople are entrepreneurs. They're one and the same, right? So if you're out here, you're promoting your podcast, you have to sell it. You have to market it, sell it. You've got, you've got uh, your, your apparel. You're trying to sell that on Shopify. So anybody go out, check the stuff on Shopify, buy that stuff up now, right? But this is this is the thing. So the podcast is going to be based around realtors. It's going to be anybody that has their own business. It's going to be salespeople in general, whatever you sell. You can sell computers. You can sell Tesla. You can sell whatever it is. You could be a trader, a day trader. I'm going to have a very wide variety of people on there. Um, you know, I will have, you know, I'll probably have people that like support East Coast financing, like Pat, like Gavin, like those people that come on there because even fighters, you are still an entrepreneur. You are building your own brand along the way. And, you know, you have to sell yourself like Gavin and them, they, they did an amazing job getting him into the UFC card that came to Halifax, yes. right? It was good. Post, post, post. You need this. You need that. You need Tucker. You need Tucker. Awesome. And then he got in there and just killed it. He's doing incredible, right? He sold himself. So fighters can be on there. You know, Pat Stay, yeah, a rapper. You have to, like, he's a salesperson. He has to be. He's selling his brand, right? He's getting people to love what he says. That is what I do every day is I get people to like what I say enough to accept the recommendation of what I'm going to give them. So it can be anybody that's on there, but it's the basis of the podcast is going to be sales and business. Right. I'm sold. I really, I really think it's going to be <laughs> awesome. Uh, I'm jealous yeah. to get all these camera angles. I'm like, damn, I want that. So we'll have to we'll have to share notes and uh I, you come down, we'll get you on. Yeah, all right. Um, hey, Brad, I, I really I really appreciate you coming on. You're somebody that, you know, we talked out outside of um this podcast. Um, you know, uh Sean or 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 Andrew Thomas. Uh, you know, he brought you up a long, long time ago. He said, you got to have this guy on the podcast. He's a really awesome guy. Um, yeah. So I, I really appreciate you coming on because I think we kind of, wow. in this podcast, checked a lot of boxes. I mean, this I is so. a boxing podcast, but we have fighters, of course. But more than that, we, we like to talk about, you know, the mental aspect, uh, you, you know, mental health. Um, you know, talking, you know, when you were talking about your story about, uh, about being in jail and whatnot, I mean, maybe not everybody has been in that situation, but certainly people have uh, felt, you know, in isolation with, with COVID and everything going on and, and having those thoughts and stuff. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing all those interesting tidbits of knowledge. Um, and it, by the way, I, I do look forward to all your future posts. You're, you're somebody I'm always following. Um. Appreciate yeah. It. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Okay, brother. Thanks for having me, man. I got to get back to work. Go do what I do. All hey, right. Brother, you have a great day. Take care. I appreciate it.
And I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. I think we touched on quite a few topics, not even just about fighting, although fighting was a component of what we talked about. We talked about motivation. We talked about success, entrepreneurship. We talked about Brad's story and maybe some of the difficult times that he had went through and how that ultimately landed him into jail, but then how he was able to turn his life around. You know, now Brad... He has a lovely family, and I'm really happy that he's been able to take a negative and turn it into a positive. This is what the podcast is all about. Take the bad and put it into something good. So uh, without further ado, guys, the usual, if you're listening to this podcast for the first time and you enjoy it, uh, make sure to leave a uh, rating on your preferred platform. Uh, Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel or subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform. And that way, when a new episode comes out, you won't miss it. And until next time, guys, whatever time you listen to this podcast, I hope you have a good rest of your day. And we'll catch you on the flip side. Take care.